Thank you, Marie. That was a lovely introduction. I'm seeing myself in a whole new light. Um, this, the first poem that I'm going to read is called The Dowry. Look at my daughters. Count them if you wish. Look at their shoulders, taut and cool as grape skin. The lovely way they sit in control of the plaza. There is power in stillness. Look inside their heads. Do you like it in there? What do you see? You must be mistaken. Look again. Look at their brooches, set with jewels from the mid-afternoon. The fly, the ant, the last drop of dew from the alderman's lips. Look at the gold strong teeth smiling across their throats. Have you finished counting? We'll count them again. I always feel really strict when I read that last line. It's the voice that I use on my children sometimes. It's, I'll say like, and is it tidy? And they'll be like, we'll double check. <laughs> Do you remember when people used to go on holiday and they would take 24 photographs or, or 36 if, if they were going for two weeks? Well, now people come round for dinner and they bring their iPad and they've got 600. And I feel a little bit excluded from all of that because I don't have a passport at the moment and I haven't had for a couple of years. But one thing that I've noticed is that the camera and then the photographs and then the story all kind of stand in between the traveller and the experience. They kind of dilute the experience a little bit. And this, this poem is about that. It's called The Tourist. There was a fantastic stairway that contained an entire world. Each step held pot plants and men in huddled groups conjuring secrets. An artist complete with easel teetered a third way up, accomplished as he was, and he was incredible. The scene was too much. To see him cry was quite unsettling. Besides strange apartments like adventures lining the walls of the stairway, climbers bowed their heads into fragrant window boxes and continued on intoxicated. A filthy beggar woman, rags hanging like charred skin, pestered holidaymakers with a question. Who can recommend a pretty hotel? About two thirds up and slightly to the right, an area, say, six feet by six feet square just disappeared into the mist. I took a photograph, but it really doesn't do the scene justice. The minute you arrive, have the cab driver take you there directly. That's the bitterness of the untravelled. I'm going, going to definitely get a passport next year and I'm going to get an iPad as well. This poem's called The Banker Considers. I have an idea and would like you to invest. Behind his, de his desk carved from tears, the banker says, yes, I'm listening. It's a bracelet, but not like the usual kind. Attached to it are chains, a hundred tinkling down from one place, like a tassel, but not exactly. Alone or in a crowd, you hold the chains in your hand. They give comfort, they feel. Well, here, why don't you try it on? The banker rolls the chains across his hand. They settle on his upturned palm. He looks at them as if they are an injured bird. He speaks into a dictaphone. The chains are cool, then become warm. They caress the hand and tickle the palm. The chains shift and separate, are rigid yet soft. He stops, clicks the dictaphone off. I would like to hold on to this while I consider. That's bankers for you. Um, this next poem is about three things. It's about when a baby's born, the family say the word baby about a thousand times every hour. It's, where's the baby? The baby's crying. The baby's hungry. Baby, baby. It's just relentless. And it's also about a friend of mine who is so squeamish about anything to do with childbirth that he wouldn't even look at an ultrasound photograph. So there's a bit of him in the poem as well. And then finally, uh, it's about sibling rival, rivalry, which is something that's quite something to behold. Um, I saw this little toddler um, holding his sister's hand, really squeezing it tight and then stroking her with the other hand. And the mother was trying to prise the fingers off, saying, you shouldn't do it that hard. 
Uh, but you could tell he knew that he shouldn't do it that hard. And I think that that's, you know, it's something quite, quite amusing. Um, it's a prose poem and it's narrated by a man. It's called Visiting. A woman goes upstairs to have a baby. When she returns, she holds the child in her hand. It is ugly and covered in what looks like melted chocolate. She coos into the infant's ancient-looking face, which gurns and licks its lips in a spectacular fashion. The mother shows the baby around the room to her other children and to me. We all do what is expected of us. The house is full of people and the baby gets passed around and around and in the midst of all the activity, I notice one small boy take the baby and eat it. After a while, the mother can't see the baby and asks the other children to help look. Some of them choose the busy brown pattern carpet to begin their search. They keep thinking they have found something and then nudging the object with their foot, it turns out to be a piece of dried out plasticine or an old half eaten biscuit. Even the child that ate the baby is looking. He is looking in earnest as if he has actually forgotten that he was the one who gobbled the baby in the first place. I say to myself, best not get involved. <laughs> Meanwhile, the woman lies prostrate on a bench, revealing more white thigh than would normally be deemed appropriate. I avert my eyes. This is a love poem, a falling in love poem. It's about um, the untranslatability of uh, certain feelings, I think. Uh, it's called The Train Turns Corners. We gasp into the tunnel, open our eyes to the dark, we can taste the hills. When we emerge, I see the warm, wide streets of your body, the narrow streets. Inside and outside collide. We see through both windows and that spins us. The landscape and we are lovers, the mountains stroke us, the farmers' fields, the trees bow and tip their leaves. Next minute we are hurtling through a forest, through the carriage, feel the rough ground, breaking twigs, our ears are cracking. Then a movie, Jack Lemon, as some poor schmuck, gets mistaken for someone rich, starts living the high life with an obsequious butler. Then through the other window, it's me, I'm in it, I'm the girl, the girl with windswept eyelashes. Oh, Jack, my mouth says against the glass. Side by side, our thighs touching and the sides of our feet. And this is better than the exquisite sex the landscape is enjoying through both windows of the train. Heartbeats come thickly. Right, this next poem is the title poem of, of my pamphlet. When I, when I first sent this to Michael Mackman at the Rialto, it wasn't called A Bad Influence Girl, it was called something else, and, and Michael thought that this title was a better one, and, and I agree now, but at the time I was a little bit, I had some misgivings because I thought that I didn't really want the word girl in the title because I felt that I was too old to have that title. It seemed like a young person's pamphlet. And I also didn't want to be identified as the bad influence girl, which a lot of people in here know me and it's quite laughable, really. Um, but I've, I really like it now and I've, I've actually embraced it and I've even called my blog a bad influence girl. And I get loads of traffic on my blog and it looks like I'm really popular, but most of the people that come on are looking for bad girl. And they're just, they're just in for a second and then they're off looking for, I don't know, bad girl with whip or bad girl with leather or something. A bad influence girl is sampling a department store. She takes my hand, leads me into traffic just as it starts to breathe again. She runs, pulling me through five lanes, throwing her head back laughing like she's just turned sausages to gold and is wearing a string of them around her neck. At the pavement, she does a double somersault, not letting go of my hand. I'm on my back, looking up at her, she says, get up, silly. No time for snoozing. We have to go to Pink's, the biggest dog store in London. Back at her house, the bad influenced girl flings open the refrigerator to a chorus line of ready mixed mojitos, then slams it shut with a rattle and shiver from the accommodating self-portrait shoulders of dozens of photographs of the B.I.G. She snaps clips and more clips into my hair. My head is heavy under their artillery, she says. What do you think of Gaga, of Gaga, of Gaga? Don't you just love her, love her shoes? She's so out there. 
She looks down and disapproves. The bad influence girl says, no time to lose, I've got to get that puppy before the store closes and I must buy some cute little clothes with tail holes. Have another mojito if you want to and scratch some tunes and let's catch up again sometime soon. Story of my life right there. Um, this next poem is um, it's called The Lovely Garden and I've had a lot of really nice compliments about my pamphlet and people will say to me um, that uh, they really like my pamphlet and this is the favourite poem and I don't really take compliments very well. Um, if, if somebody says to me, you look really nice today, I'll say, well, what was wrong with me yesterday? <laughs> And so when people say, I really like your pamphlet, my favourite poem is The Lovely Garden, my, my, I say thank you, that's really nice, I really appreciate the feedback, but what I'm thinking is, well, what's wrong with the rest? Uh, anyway, I've built it up a little bit. Uh, the Lovely Garden. The graves were windows with their shutters down. The flowers were fresh on some and dead on others. Best is fresh, second is dead, and last is none at all. An oblong with a stone, again and again and again. Walking up and down the rolls, I realized what was wrong and felt the need to tell you quickly, just in case. I left a message. When I die, curl me up and place me in a round box. I cannot lie on my back like a corpse. I started as a circle, so don't iron me out. Don't make my last statement a linear one. And my last poem is, um, it's called The Sun is a Guillotine. The sun is a guillotine, dropping its blade, an arbitrary executioner. It makes us followers of ourselves and has us emerge around corners before us. One afternoon, walking down a parched avenue, you slip into a bar named Hoppers. The trees across the way are fidgeting on the barroom floor. You sit in a booth, your glass drips and shimmers like a cave crystal. You sit in black and white as the jukebox plays a song, then the shadow of a song. The trees do this and that, just leaves on the dance floor. She wants to lie down in your shadow. She's so in love with you that nighttime brings an irrational fear of what shadows can do. The sun beheaded three men in the bar that day, and shadows grew to ridiculous lengths. Thank you.